the gentlewoman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for conducting this oversight hearing today. And thank you, Director Ray, for being here. We really appreciate your time uh, and effort. And I represent Georgia, where we have unfortunately had some very high profile incidents of violence in the very past few years, and including the Ahmaud Aubrey killing uh, as recent, and also eight uh, individuals, and including the six women um, of Asian descent um, that just happened this past March. And so these shootings just have continued to rattle our communities and are especially troubling for communities of color. And unfortunately, we know that these high profile incidents are just part of a broader trend of increasing hate crimes that we're seeing all across the country. And my colleagues have already earlier today just uh, mentioned the startling statistics from the FBI's annual report showing the increases in hate crimes against Latinos, uh, Jewish people, and also those of Asian descent. I just have one question in this regard there. How is the FBI taking steps to help local police respond to the rise in the anti-Asian hate crimes? So as I mentioned, hate crimes are a high priority to me. Uh, you mentioned Georgia, of course, that is my home as well. Uh, so I take them, uh, those cases particularly seriously uh, and personally there. Um, we do a number of different things. Uh, one, we obviously investigate hate crimes wherever we can, and as I mentioned, we have had the highest number of hate crime initiations this year uh, that we've had in the past five years, and about a 63 percent increase in hate crimes investigations initiated over the past couple of years or so. So it's about 370, give or take, hate crimes investigations ongoing right now. We also provide support to uh, state and local, because sometimes the most readily provable offense is a state or local offense, and even in those instances, we provide support with forensics, uh, expertise, that kind of thing. We work with the Civil Rights Division over at, at uh, the Justice Department to figure out when federal charges can be brought, but we also do a lot of public outreach, both to the community and to law enforcement. One of the themes we've heard about a little bit already today and discussed is the fact that these crimes aren't reported reliably enough or uh, it's, just, it's a chronically underreported area. So, and that is something that we need to reach out to the communities and to law enforcement. So we do trainings, liaison events. Uh, for example, in the AAPI community, I think we've done 60 or so uh, events, liaison events specifically targeting that community just since last March, uh, right through the pandemic. With the Jewish community, I think there have been 340 or so training and liaison events. Uh, I mentioned earlier in New York, we recently put that as sort of a public uh, service campaign, uh, including putting it in Hebrew and Yiddish to reach uh, certain parts of the community that might be reluctant or unwilling to report. So there's a whole bunch of things like that that we're trying to do Thank to help. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. I, I'd also like to discuss ghost guns. And just recently, the president and the attorney general proposed new regulations for parts that uh, needed to build ghost guns to have serial numbers and those uh, that are purchasing them undergoing background checks. And as you know, ghost guns are firearms that can be easily produced from an online kit that requires no background check or has no serial number. Is the current data showing an increase in ghost guns found at these crime scenes? And you can just give me a simple yes or no answer to that. Uh, I'm not sure I have the reliable numbers, but I do believe we are anecdotally starting to seize so-called ghost guns more and more frequently. Uh, and in, of course, in the wrong hands, those can be very dangerous, uh, just like other kinds of guns. And I believe, as you alluded to, DOJ has recently issued a, uh, a proposed rule on the subject. Right. And as you know, law enforcement relies heavily on gun tracing in their criminal investigations. And I understand that law enforcement is just unable to trace ghost guns because they lack those serial numbers. So why, can you please tell us why gun tracing uh, is so important and how does the inability to trace ghost guns impact criminal investigations? criminal investigations and your own, the FBI's ability to help the public stay safe? Well, uh, tracing firearms is a time-honored uh, tactic in law enforcement investigations of crimes of violence. Um, and there's, it's an all too common scenario where you're recovering a firearm uh, and need to figure out where it came from. Um, 
And so absolutely, it's something we need to do as much as we can. That's, that's why, for example, uh, outside the context of ghost guns, you have individuals, for example, who will obliterate serial numbers. Uh, the reason they try to obliterate the serial numbers is precisely the, the reason that you alluded to, which is they want to prevent us from being able to trace the weapon. Uh, that is already a crime to obliterate a serial number, but um, certainly it's a subject that uh, uh, is increasingly concerning to us as we start to seize uh, ghost guns, so-called ghost guns, in a number of our cases. Time of the gentlelady. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Christopher Ray was flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, and I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C., there is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? 
They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other capital she's ever been in is a state capital that's open 24 seven. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they wanna prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is, it's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.